Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here as we begin a new adventure in Balefire Blues Patch Lightbringer 1.0. So we're going to start a new campaign with Navarro with General Featherfall, and we're going to leave off historical AI focuses just to see what things are like. Custom game rules, everything's going to be just pretty much the same as it is by default. So let us begin with Navarro. The mods we're using are seven. Balefire Blues, Equestriate War, the Old World Blues, Old World Blues Radio, Player of the Peace Conferences, and the State Transfer Tool Mod, and Colored Events. Cool. If you'd like to read about Navarro in 1235, go right ahead, which I'll scroll down a little bit more as well for everyone who wants to read about this stuff. There we go. And the Enclave of Present Day. We are, my friends, Navarro with the Enclave. Let us begin. Now, I will warn you. There is a lot of reading in the beginning stages here of this campaign. So, in the chaos of the Great War, as Pegasi were sent to the slaughter by the thousands, a small group of influential dissidents made a plan. A grand conspiracy to start off with three research slots. But, actually, let's look at the spirits first because we have a stable food supply for now. Monthly population goes down by 90%. A weak senate, more political advisory costs and less war support, as well as a strong Council, which really hurts our industry, technology, research speed. So that is not very bueno. So instead, well, we'll still do our industry stuff. Ooh, max factories in the state is not bad. Power armor, advanced Pegasi. We'll have to make a decision regarding those stuff. Ohm's Law is always rewarding to start off with. We'll go with some combat language. And I'm only going to keep one slot probably for industry maybe. It just, it costs so much to research. Ugh, it's not very good. And let's go ahead and make some more infantry divisions because we have the Enclave Company, which is not bad. I love it. And actually, you don't really look like... Well, that's definitely not a pony. Pipe guns. Uh, uh, well, I mean, we have our cultural generic power armor platoon. I'm not seeing too much armor on that one. But hey, you know what? Maybe I'm just not seeing it correctly. Power platoons, power platoons. Cool. But we can't make any more because we are probably at our cap for special divisions. Special forces divisions. So there you go. We have... Four power armor divisions, which is actually very, very nice. Let's go ahead and set this stuff up first. We have Autumn Leaf, who we are trying to get as a leader because it was recommended that we should do so. So we shall do that. Uh, and Autumn Leaf will be leading these guys, in which, yes, Seal Wing. Cool, let's let time go on because it's going to take a while to get here. But this stable dweller, Little Pip's adventure, has massive ramifications regarding this region of the wasteland. From deciding the fate of Shattered Hoof to stopping the goddess, her effects can be followed across the wasteland. As such, it's up to you to decide how our adventure should be handled. Now, I've already played as Red Eyed Slavers once, and I chose Simple AI for a recommended path. Player controlled, good amount of experience, or Random AI? I'll go Random AI. I'll see what happens. Really kind of interested in seeing what happens. After this is the fateful day. When the war came to an end, and a thousand Balefire Suns lit up Equestria, we knew that all hope was lost. Equestria was dead, but we would not be dragged down with it. So, the Grand Conspiracy. Unknown to even the Princess, throughout the Great War against Zebraka, Zebraka, a plan was being set in motion, a plan conceived by one of Equestria's core pony tribes, the Pegasi. This plan was conceived solely by Pegasi military, political, and industrial officials, and only a small hoofville outside of these types knew of it. The plan in question was the Pegasi abandonment of Equestria known as the Grand Conspiracy. The simple premise is that should Equestria lose a war against the Zebras, or if Balefire bombs rain across the globe, the Pegasi, mainly those of the political, military, and industrial importance, would take to the skies and hide amongst the clouds as a fallback po point, essentially leaving the rest of Equestria to their fate. There is at least one third of Equestria's populace would remain unscathed, and from there they would organize and try to forge their own Equestria in their own image. <clears throat> if the plan was ever found out, those involved would likely be have been executed for treason against Equestria. However, the plan of betrayal was never discovered, and on the day the world ended, they were quick to put it into motion. This conspiracy would result in the birth of all Pegasi governments above the clouds, and who, and who all loosely banded together in a coalition known as the Enclave. In the planning phases of the conspiracy, there was a great deal of disagreement as to who should lead the new Pegasi governments. Should it be the political and industrial office officials, who knew how to keep political stability and economic prosperity, or the military officers, who knew how to strengthen or keep strength and peace from within and without? Both factions managed to clean under power in different parts of the Enclave, but only one managed to play a role in the founding of New Cloudsdale. That one was the military officers, which you get more war support, or politicians and corporates. Corporates. Now, we already have 92% stability. That's pretty good. We need, we definitely need some more war support, so I'm going to go with the one for military officers. And because Balefire Blues goes so quickly, this will be done within like three seconds. So, the city of New Cloudsdale. New Cloudsdale, the jewel of the Enclave, de facto capital, seats of the Senate, and host to one of the largest fleets of Thunderheads and Raptors to exist. A beautiful, a city beaut of beautiful clouds, steeped in culture and tradition. I do not know, I do not know why I could not say clouds or beautiful. Very weird. The fateful day, though. We knew the end was coming. 
We knew that despite the best efforts of the Diarch, it would all come crumbling down. We knew that whatever or whoever wins, we lose. The first great sign was Celestia's abdication, the next was Zipperkin response to Luna's ascension to the throne. Not even we know who fired the first mega spell, but it matters little now. What matters is the result and the panic that following the end of the world. Countless souls were lost, countless more found safety within the stables or other forms of shelter, and we took to the skies. It was our plan all along to use the clouds to hide from the Tartarus below, and we assumed that the griffins or even the dragons wouldn't dare follow us into our own domain. <clears throat> And we were right. However, we lacked any real plan as to who or what to focus on saving as the end occurred. Some urged us to gather as many pickets as we could to save more lives, while others argued that we needed to gather as much military equipment and technology as we could so that we would have an uncontested military advantage once the dust settled. A split-second decision was made, and those who would go on to become our city's founders focused on saving as many pickets as they could. Valuable military assets. Ooh, common weaponry is not bad. Right now we have some power armor, which is really cool. Ooh, X01 power armor. A hundred units of that? Oh, man. X01. X01. Really? X01 is okay. 60 armor and 85% reliability versus X02, which has 70% hardness and 5.5 max speed. 50 armor, actually, but 90% reliability. Actually, X01 has more uh, hardness. Or armor, I should say. Hard armor, armor, armor. 18 breakthrough versus 21. Uh, as much as, like, X01 power armor... I think there's as many as Pegasi as we could for now. I think that just probably makes just... That's just better. As much as I would love to have more and more power armor, it's not like we're making any more divisions right now anyway. So, after this, we're going to do the election campaign. With elections looming on the horizon, several notable candidates have started campaigning. This city of New Cloudsdale. Much to the horror and dismay of the surviving Pegasi, the Pegasus capital, the world Cloudsdale, was one of the first cities vaporized by... Excuse me, Zeprakin Balefire missiles on that fateful day. The survivors were eager to start anew and set to work building a new city. The new a new clouds deal that would become the prime jewel of the Enclave, a city that Pegasi from across the clouds of Equestria could look up to for hope. Now, southward of what little is left of Cloudsdale, flies a great city of New Cloudsdale, a grand city that is as large as old Cloudsdale and eventually grew to become one of the most powerful cities within the Enclave as a whole. The city of New Cloudsdale is a monument to and the pinnacle of the efforts of countless Pegasi that had dedicated themselves to rebuilding Equestria in the Enclave's image. In the first years of New Cloudsdale construction was a matter of great good debate as to what the city's future would be. An advanced military industrial complex dedicated to manufacturing the Enclave's weapons? Or sprawling civilian metropolis with civilian industries and housing much similar to the old Cloudsdale? Eventually the bulk of New Cloudsdale was comprised of advanced arms industry, which is not bad, or a large civilian sector, which we remove three arms workshops and get four civilian factories. Uh, I don't like removing arms workshops. I really don't. As much as I love the civilian factories, and we can't really do anything with what we have now. I'm going to go with Advanced Arms Industries just because I think that's going to be a little bit more worth it. Raptor Cloud... What are Raptor Cloud Ships? Let's go up to 50 for that. Uh, let's take a look. Actually, let's take a look. Planes. Good. Oh, we actually have monoplane fighters already. So, with Red Eye Slavers, you have Pinkie Pie Balloons. Oh, research Mom Balloons, huh? Raptor Cloud Ships. Jesus Christ, that, that ground attack. Oh my gosh! Oh, good lord, that is, that is, mmm, I like that. Make more of those. And then actually, so we really have two of these, huh? This is just slightly higher cost. They're somewhat different in terms of resources needed. So it's the XO1's on top. Two, 18, 80. Two, 21, 70, so less hardness, but more breakthrough. Five and a half speed, as we already established. Four and a half speed, so a little slower. But there's a little bit more armor on those. 90% reliability, uses 0.7 in the bottom. Same cell usage. Oh, man. I, you know, maybe we'll just make both. That's not with me. Discuss the population crisis. The Enclave has always had a problem with overpopulation. Though much work has been done to handle this problem, some believe a change in strategy may be required. Wow. We don't have a lot of uh, political power. We can disable backstory decisions, too. Uh, we get an event here hopefully soon, maybe? Uh, election campaign, maybe not. The voting rights debate. The Enclave has always had a free and open democracy with every citizen having the ability to vote. However, there's always been a recent push, there has been a recent push to place restrictions on this right. On the population crisis, the management of the population has been a significant issue since the formation of the Enclave, one that has plagued its society since its very inception. It began in the infamous recovery camps, the, dis the desperate refugee camps that held those Pegasi fortunate enough to escape Cloudsdale or the surface. It continued on with the first famine, an event so terrible that it killed an estimated one-fifth of the population. Today, though, it has resulted in the strict control of reproduction by the state, the Enclave having maintained a strict two-child policy aside from those who have earned the privileges of additional offspring. This question has shaped modern Pegasi society, affecting general customs, perceptions, and even the approach to romantic relationships. The culture is adapted to meet the needs of the nation, generally manifesting the same-sex relationships being rewarded and tax breaks for those who chose not to have children. Despite this enormous
enormous cultural adaptation, the province continued to wear down the very foundation of the enclave, the weight of the members it yearns to protect weighing it down. Recently, the issue has been begun to boil over. As a strain of limited food supplies, cramped living spaces, and repressed sexual tensions, this is, this is getting weird, continue to bear down on the population, the pressure has become palpable. The Council and Senate have assembled today to address this issue once more, the tightly packed room serving as yet another reminder of the ever-present issue. Today, the primary clash is between General Featherfall, who is leading us right now, of the Justice and Order Party, and General Tornado, a long-term advocate for unity within the Enclave. While many of these uh, of those present expect this to be another repeat of the arguments made in the past, today will be somewhat more significant. Now we're talking about Featherfall's speech. General Featherfall began slowly making his way over the central podium, his back leg dragging behind him, an injury obtained during the Griffin incursion. He surveys the crowd for several seconds, taking a sip from his glass of water, positioned on the podium by an aide before beginning to speak, his voice dry and dismissive. The issue that has come before the council today is one that has been repeated by a hundred different ponies in a hundred different times. I have lived through countless movements just like this one. I've lived to see them fade as their champions realize the foolishness of their proposals and quietly withdraw from the political scene, doing their best to hide their shame. The only too surprising aspect of this iteration of the argument is a stallion making it. I truly expect better from General Tornado. Though I suppose heroism doesn't necessarily bring wisdom, I'll make this fast and simple, my colleagues. He drags his tired gaze across the ponies assembled, allowing them to clearly see his disdain for the topic at hoof. Let's break down the recent president. I admit some of that concerns are legitimate, but others are just decadent. In regards to the stretched food supplies, I will point to historical precedent. Things have always been difficult, though we will have always prevailed. The last actual famine was four years ago, lasting only a few short months before our ration was able to address it once more. That's a simple fact of life here in the sky, one that won't change regardless of our feelings in that regard. Toughen up and understand the reality of the situation, ponies. As for living space, please, we live in the greatest conditions left in the world, conditions more luxurious than those on the ground could even be dream of. Stop letting your greed dictate your actions, it is not befitting of you, finally. I hesitate to even address this point, though I must, I feel I must, given the emphasis you have placed upon it. He allows a long pause, directing an accusatory gaze up towards the ponies in the audience. The fact that you see is... Sexual satisfaction as a serious issue speaks poorly of you. Is the younger generation so promiscuous and hedonistic that they can think of nothing other than the <clears throat> a bonking on a cloud speaks poorly of your generation? That is an issue shows the blatant irresponsibility of those assembled, the sheer inability to control their <clears throat> base impulses. The flesh is weak. Shame on you all. He waves his hoof as the now utterly silent council trudging back towards the bench, ignoring their stunned stares as he hefts himself onto the cloudy seat, grunting with effort as he adjusts his leg. Tornado speech in the midst of the silence. Tornado stood, instantly drawing to him with his sudden movement. He took the time to survey the crowd, his glowing prosthetic eye and imposing set to the younger representatives present. Finally, he began to make his ways down to the podium. His gait still steady, steady despite his advanced age and result of the advanced training regimen he still practiced to this day. When he finally reached the podium, he stood in silence for several moments before speaking, his traditional enclave dress uniform still pristine despite its obvious age. The gleaming metals glistened or lined his chest, only adding to its luster. With an abrupt nod, he begins to speak, his powerful voice commanding attention from all those present. Twelve years ago, our people suffered as our ancestors did as famine once more laid low our great city. Twelve years ago, an estimated 10,000 ponies died of starvation. This problem has always plagued our people, and so long as we sit here and refuse to address it, it shall continue to do so. General Featherfall proposes that we do do just that. Sit here and wait for yet another famine to strike our city, center our home, and wither our people. We can and must prevent the strategy or the tragedy of famine in the future instead of merely trying to salvage the equine wreckage or the famine with pious regret and empty promises. How much longer will we have to wait until someone is willing to take the decisive action to address this most pressing issue? How long must we wait until the council does what needs to be done? His voice rises in both volume and tempo as he speaks, his eyes locked with the enraptured ponies within the audience. For the last 200 years, we've been forced to bear the weight of our civilization upon our shoulders, left without a moment of rest as we work to maintain our lives above the clouds. For the last 200 years, the Pegasi of the Enclave have been forced to contend with terrible famine, cramped conditions, and never-ending scarcity. We have worked, we have saved, we have sacrificed, but we have never given up. We have never lowered ourselves to the base level of savagery that is now so common upon this surface. No, we must, we must, we have this, we have let the struggle define us. His voice softens as he pauses, taking a moment to present a genuine smile to the crowd before continuing. Tornado continues. We have let the struggle forge our people into something greater. More than ever before, the Pegasi tribes become a paragon of sacrifice, endurance, and integrity. With our diligence, we have built a new society for ourselves. We have given everything to ensure survival. We've come a long way since we first shepherded the shell-shocked survivors of Cloudsdale into the relief camps. We've built new cities, repaired massive fleets, and grown a new culture. After all of this, we deserve something better, all of us. We deserve an opportunity to love who we love, to raise a family, to stretch our wings and live free. We deserve a chance to have our own homes rather than communal apartments to indulge somewhat on special occasions. 
We deserve a chance to not fear the ever-present specter of famine. We are a unique people. We have survived the end of the world with our dignity and, and civilization intact. As the sole arbiter of civilization left in the world, it is important that we show we can no longer afford to wither away among the clouds, eking out the last bit of power present in centuries-old machinery. He surveys those present. <clears throat> we deserve a new home. We deserve a place where we can do all those things and more. I understand that many of these present would consider this foolish. After all, how can we barely stand the strain of our population as it is? How can we ever hope to expand? Where would we go when every acre of land must be devoted to the cloud farms? I have an answer for you, my friends. He leans into the microphone, allowing a moment of tension to build before speaking. We descend. We build a new home for ourselves among the rubble left below. It will be hard, but we have done such things before. We have succeeded before. If our people can survive the apocalypse itself, we can surely survive the scattered remnants it left behind. I see my remaining time to the chamber. With a nod, Tornado steps down from the podium, returning to the tight ranks of his loyalists, disappearing behind the sturdy and scarred veterans of the Enclave's old guard faction. After a moment of silence, the chamber erupts into a fierce debate. Despite his colorful arguments, Featherfall is correct. The status quo is acceptable, or Tornado clearly makes the better arguments. I like both, but... I want to get Autumn Leaf in power, so we got to go with as much destruction as possible. So it's only two percent, minus five percent doesn't really help us here. So there we go. I told you there's going to be a lottery, and this is just the beginning. Uh, Dashite question: The Dashites are outcasts, exiled for the beliefs and helping those below the clouds. Could they have the right idea, though? Perhaps. On voting restrictions. One of the key features that sets the Enclave apart from the old Equestria is that every citizen holds the right to vote, regardless of the city, wealth, or individual status. Every citizen is able to cast a vote for the preferred representatives on both the high and low councils. Many across the Enclave consider this to be one of the core aspects of their society, an aspect that allows them to maintain or claim moral and philosophical superiority over the absolutist rule of the Alicorns. Recent months have seen a surprising and worrying shift in opinion, however. Several representatives have spoken out in favor of restricting the franchise, expanding the requirements of military service from the candidate to encompass the electorate as a whole. While this was initially met with their outrage and outcries, the charismatic words of the fiery young Colonel Autumn have surprised many. Equally strong were the words of the Senate Majority Leader, Seafire, who fiercely decried Autumn's proposal as regressive and undemocratic. The two clashed on the Senate floor early today, making both strong remarks in favor of their respective stances on the issue. Autumn Leaf takes the floor. Autumn, the proposal's most prominent advocate, spoke first as he paced across the open floor of the Senate Hall. Clothed in traditional enclave dress uniform, the Colonel cut an imposing figure as he delivered his fiery speech. As we move forward, we must accept the simple fact that by permitting irresponsible authority, we are selling ourselves to disaster. For the last 200 years, we have placed our trust with those who have had the experience and discipline of military service to lead us, allowing them to guide our path through history. For the last 200 years, they've done so with a level of skill, honor, and strength found nowhere else within history. Their sage guidance has allowed us to move forward from the recovery camps of old. It allowed us to emerge from the tainted dust of the old world unscathed. For 200 years, we have trusted them to guide us into the future, a trust that had proven and reciprocated 10 times over. As it stands, we are on the brink of a new era for our people, one that will define now or how we are remembered by history. We cannot afford to falter at this most delicate point to weaken ourselves by accepting the opinion that those that lack the honor of service on an equal level will require military service for a reason. It serves as the ultimate test of character. Without this protection, our democracy would have failed long ago, swept aside by the taint of radical populism that Seafire so eagerly endorses. What I propose today would expand the requirements we place upon the candidates to the base of the system itself, allowing us to raise electorate that meet the quality of those that they choose to govern. Then and only then can we truly move forward in our new era, assuring that we will not falter when we are tested. Adam completes his speech with a furious stamp of his hoof, taking a long moment to gaze up at the assembly assembled senators and counselors. I rest my case, and Seafire responds. He Seafire. He rises to his hooves as Autumn withdraws into his squeak, fading from view with a sigh and advances to the podium, dressed in his formal suit. A stark contrast to the colonel's uniform, with a practiced smile, he begins to address a crowd. Citizens, soldiers, and friends. Today, we meet here in the halls of New Clouds, the other capital of our people. It wasn't always our capital, though. 200 years ago, the right was reserved for the first clouds, Dale, the greatest city our people ever knew within these vaunted, vaunted halls. Some of the greatest dream dramas of history played out. Commander Hurricane led the conquest of the Pegasi tribes, forging us into a united people. Commander Ironhand led his legendary defense against a dragon menace, driving them back from the ancient bastion at the center of the city. Flash Magnus ensured the continuation of that unity in the uncertain times of the Shadow War, despite all of this history. The city was destroyed in a single stroke. It wasn't our fault, though. No. He offers a grim smile to the silent crowd, allowing the tension to draw out as the seconds continued on. No. It wasn't our fault, my friends. We had merely done our duty, done what was expected of us. We did not decide to start the war with the zebras. We did not choose to plunge our nation into battle after a hundred decades of... A uh, hundred decades of undisturbed peace. We did not choose to develop the weapons that would end our world. No, that was the choice of the Alicorns. As a result of their arrogance, their zealotry, and their absolute rule, they plunged our nation into a war that would destroy the world. What Autumn is calling for today? It would do the same. He proposes stripping the power away from the ponies, placing it solely in the hooves of a singular organization, an organization that holds loyalty to him alone. Not only would he cast aside our most trusted and treasured tradition of democracy for this unseemingly 
ambition, he would do so with the intent of permanently eradicating the franchise to secure his grip. The issue today before us is not one of civil politics, it is one of survival. Not only for our people, as Autumn so brazenly suggests, but for our culture and the very beliefs it is based upon. Autumn would have us cast out of sight, embracing the authoritarianism that destroyed our world in the past. It is our job, duty, too, to deny that those that would destroy what we hold most dear. Our democracy must not be the envy of the wasteland, but the engine of our own renewal. There's nothing wrong with the enclave that cannot be cured by what is right with the enclave. I rest my case and urge my colleagues here to make the right decision. In which Autumn Leaf is completely correct, because we want Autumn Leaf to lead. And he has a total of 4%, 4.29% of popularity. It is what it is. And then we'll follow up with address resource scarcity. Though the Enclave has resources to make do, they have a little more than that. A solution to the issue has been proposed, but many are hesitant to back it. On Wastelander rights, the issue of Wastelanders has always been a touchy subject within the Enclave society, one that is often relegated to arguments around the dinner table rather than serious discussions within the halls of government. Today, however, this has changed. For the first time in history, the Senate has been called together to discuss the issue at the behest of none other than the Majority Leader Seafire, the most prominent progressive reformist in New Cloudsdale. While many have grumbled about the session, even more have attended drawing forth by distaste, association, or curiosity. For the majority of the Senate gathered, Seafires emerged from his cluster of allies and protégés, ready to present his case in favor of the Wastelanders. The murmured conversation comes to a halt as he arrives at the podium, taking up a position be behind and offering his trademark smile to the symbol of Pegasite. Hello again, friends! I'm glad so many of you could make it here today given the short notice. With how many of you are packed in here, I assume that you're already familiar with the topic of today. Wastelanders! Now, this is always something that we've always been hesitant to talk about, I mean, unless you're Colonel Autumn or one of his cronies, but that's a side note. In all seriousness, I think it's very important that we discuss this now rather than later, given everything that's happened. With all the changes going on now, we may have to hold a solid policy towards the surface much sooner than we first thought. Which is a really terrifying thought. I mean, there are those ponies that we haven't really interacted improperly with in two centuries. And when it comes down to it, that's the core of this. They're ponies, not wastelanders. Seafar continues. He looks out at the crowd, surveying their expressions. For the most part, he's met with the boredom, neutrality, and active malice from Autumn's clique. Nothing unexpected, so he continues on. And yes... I mean what I said. We treat them like they're some different species, that they're intrinsically different than us. Admittedly, there are a number of cultural differences, but that doesn't change the simple fact that at our core we're all still ponies. The main thing that sets us apart on a biological level is that we have a pair of wings and less radiation. Beyond that, we're pretty much the same. Now, on an actual personal level, that's where we run into issues. It's a simple fact that we are on average healthier, stronger, better educated, and more disciplined. And of course more civilized than the ma vast majority of ponies on the surface. This is something that can't be ignored as a place as a natural barrier between us and them, but we also can't ignore that they are ponies, just like you and me. We can't ignore that over a thousand years ago we were faced with a similar situation, and once again, we can't ignore that the pony tribes only achieve true prosperity by working past their differences and acknowledging one another's equal nature, if not inability. The room is silent as the dialogue continues increasingly radical, although some appear to be intrigued by his words. I believe that if we approach these ponies as inherently equal, we can forge a better world for our foes. Of course, we must maintain a degree of separation. Our cultural differences would make full integration impossible. We should certainly take steps to bridge that gap. To acknowledge that we aren't inherently superior due to the wings at our back, well, that may be. Just maybe. They are worthy of some compassion as well. It concludes, preparing to stop before reconsidering. What else? See, Fa continues. Well, something else I want to talk about on the topic of compassion, Dashites. We all know them. We all hate them, right? But why? What does that punishment actually mean? As he continued on, he drew increasingly incredulous stares from the audience, his protégés gaping, gaping in surprise at the unplanned tangent. Yes, I understand that it means banishment, but why do we practice it? Why do we honor some mare that abandoned us 200 years ago by ensuring that she is remembered by those who would happily follow in her footsteps? And most of all, why do we punish those who only crime and his compassion with something like that? Now, I'm not saying that traitors like Deadshot Calamity should be forgiven. They committed ra actual crimes after all, no. What I don't get is why ponies like Radar are punished for being willing to perform a simple act of kindness that's what God has banished after all, isn't it? Dropping medical supplies to a dying mare? Who wouldn't do that? The shock has started to fade, with some staring in anger, others in consideration, while the vast majority sit in an awkward sort of silence. What I mean is this, the term dash right only serves as another way to separate us from the ponies on the surface, to remember how a mare betrayed our entire civilization 200 years ago. Let's forget her. Let's forget the brand! Let's forget this concept as a whole. Empathy shouldn't be punished. It's only natural that you feel for your fellow ponies. If some pony commits a crime serious enough to warrant a greater punishment, just dust them. Don't make him a martyr and release him into the wild. That only makes him more dangerous. What I suggest is a reconciliation of sorts with those that were cast up preemptively. That way we can start healing this wound that ancient betrayal left. The crowd is silent, so many processing what he just said. While they had expected a defense of the Wastelanders, no pony, not even his allies, had expected him to come out in favor of the Dashites. Finally, the reactions began to filter through. Angry jeering as the crowd rejects Seafire's ideas wholesale. Pretty good. Awkward silence as no pony really wants to be associated with the idea Seafire just expounded. Or hesitant applause as many within the crowd find his beliefs somewhat reasonable, if extreme. It's time for some angry jeering, my friends. Nice. Eight. Not bad. We're getting a little bigger. A little bigger. That's good. 
comp. Hey, we actually got some technology done. I told you there's a lot of reading in this one. Oof. And that's okay. Alright, let's get some secret language, because secret language is good. And some reference manuals. Never any scarcity, we'll do that after the cum cumulus aid shipments. Some of our industry is being diverted in order to help rebuild the cumulus federate. For, what was that? The federatia. Cool, never any scarcity. Life above the clouds is defined by scarcity. This is a simple fact, one inherent to the environment itself. Despite all this, opponents of the Enclave have been able to scrounge up what resources they need, making use of anything and everything available. Water is extracted from the clouds themselves. Clouds seeding allowed for a meager source of food, and the few remaining mountain peaks allowed for a source of minerals, though they have long since been depleted. Despite these factors, life is still hard. The entirety of the Enclave's existence resolves around the struggle to survive, a struggle that has continued since its very foundation, one born in hunger and sickness of the recovery camps, a struggle that continued even as they were built. Due to this, the never ending conflict against nature itself. The Enclave has a unique appreciation for the true value of solid matter. What many below might see as trash is carefully stockpiled, managed, and allotted to fit the needs of society. From there, it's transformed to meet the needs of the society, whatever they may be. It's used to its fullest extent, beyond long what it would see as reasonable. When it finally expires, its use having been extinguished, it is not simply discarded, it is returned to the stockpiles, broken down into its base components, and recycled in many ways possible. Today, two factions have come together to debate an issue that will transform the Enclave forever. The issue of obtaining resources from the surface. This issue has no has the potential to end the great struggle and finally let the children of the sky claim the birthright they have so long pro been promised. To claim the birthright of their foes, ensure that the Pegasi of the Enclave never again have to suffer under the endless scarcity of the sky, the decision here made today will steer the course of the Enclave into the future, whatever it may be. Tornado speaks. General Tornado speaks behind uh, stands behind the podium, his features cold and schooled as he collects his thoughts, using his one good eye to examine the crowd before him. The stallion is dressed in his iconic armor, the wear and tear on the surface showcasing a lifetime of service to his people. With a deep breath he speaks, we must understand the importance of our decision here, for it will define our future. I understand that there are those that promise or propose things, such as trading for the resources we require to survive in a perfect world. We would descend to the world below, exchanging kind words with those dwelling there. Unfortunately, we do not live in a perfect world. The world as we find it. It is as it is. We, we have, you have to deal with that reality, and there are monsters in this world. There are countless numbers below that would love nothing more than to expand their reach to our havens. To kill, rape, and maim as they will. To spread their demented chaos to our cities, to tear us down to the level, and yet you object when I refuse to kiss these monsters on the cheek and say, Pretty please, as we beg them for the resources we need to survive. Tell me, which of the ponies here would you put in harm's way so you wouldn't seem like a nasty fella? He locks eyes with Seafire, staring him down for a moment before continuing to speak. I will not apologize for trying to keep your family safe. And I will not apologize for trying to do what needs to be done to ensure that your families can sleep safely at night. It has been my honor to be the servant of the Enclave. It has been my honor to be servant of our people. As a general of the Enclave, it is my sworn duty to do as is right by our people to ensure that we can survive. For the last 200 years, we have endlessly struggled to ensure that chaos and despair never again darken our doorstep. We have failed in the past, but this struggle has made us who we are. There is only one true source of victory in this struggle. Honored colleagues. He allows a long pause staring at the assembled ponies. We must take what we need. The surface has all the resources it could ever desire in excess, yet despite this, there are little more than a series of vicious raiders, meager communities, and brutal warlords. They have all the resources that they could ever desire, enough to ensure that every pony could live a safe and stable life. Yet, despite this, there are more than just there are little more than just savages, playing in the shadow of a greater civilization, our civilization. We have nothing but our, what our forefathers have left for us, nothing but the resources we've been able to gather with our, in our own hooves. Yet despite this, we are the pinnacle of equestrian civilization, a beacon of strength, freedom, and order across the wasteland. Now, this isn't to say that they are all savages, sadists, and barbarians. I've been to the surface before, and I can tell you that there are still plenty of good ponies down there. He offers a light smile to the crowd, but expecting many present with a rare show of emotion. However, the vast majority of them aren't. The vast majority aren't simply trying to carve a life for themselves in an uncaring wasteland. No, they use it to slay, oppress, and torture their fellow pony. They use it to establish a cruel dominion over those will unwilling to use the very same tactics. This, above all things, justifies our right to seize what we need, nay, deserve from those that would have it. The resources below could end our struggle, not in the ever-present threat of defeat, but in the golden light of victory. We could win a final victory, end the constant state of the scarcity that has haunted our people. All we need to do is understand that it is ours for the taking, that it belongs to you. This is your birthright, my friends. All we need to do is take it. There is a moment of silence before the speech was greeted with thunderous applause. Seafire speaks. Sifar looked out upon the cheering crowds, disheartened but not discouraged. The path of the peacemaker was never easy, though he would never trade it for anything else. He understood that if he didn't take up his this path. Few others would, with a signature grin. Seafire steps up as Tornado offers him the podium, offering him a courteous a nod as he does. Turning to the assembled representatives, he waits for them to quiet down before beginning to speak. His voice much, was quite smooth and calm despite his previous misgivings. Or misgivings. 
Hello again, friends. I have to say, I'm rather impressed by the passion of General Tornado's proposal, if not its contents, as, while he has the right idea, he's approaching it in the very wrong way. The way we would see us descend to their level, making use of violence to enforce our will upon those less fortunate than ourselves. Haven't we learned better than this? This isn't to say that the resource issue isn't the core of our society's woes. I think that we're all smart enough to see that the truth in that regard, so I don't feel a pressing need to say what's already been said. And I... And those aligned with those, with though we don't necessarily disagree with his argument as a whole, we do live in an imperfect world. He grins at the crowd for a moment. We would be, we wouldn't be stuck up here if it was perfect. But as he said, we don't live in a perfect world. He came to the conclusion that as a result of this imperfection, we need to make use of force to take what we need. I see it as a different way. I see it as yet another example of the world urging us to aspire to perfection to seek to be better than we are. We have in our hooves immense power to do both good and evil. Power that we have refrained from using due to the fear of the unknown. I would not suggest that we greet the unknown with open hooves, for that would be foolish. Instead, I suggest that we offer a hoof in greeting. After all, we have plenty to give that isn't our resources. He gestures to the Senate's hall towering ceiling, carefully crafted walls, drawing their attention to the grandeur of its construction. The sky is a harsh mistress, my friends, but while she takes much from us, she also grants us much in return, even if it isn't obvious. For example, let's look to the sun. We experience sunlight every day up here. It's a normal part of life. Down there, they live in our shadow. They dream of the sun, of the warmth that brings on a cool spring day. What about water? That's one of the things that we've always had more than enough of, isn't it? Did you actually know the ponies down below die of thirst of all things? Can we make it literally fall from the sky on that topic? What about storms? They're a bit of thunder uh, to us, but nothing serious to them. It's a terrifying onslaught from the sky, pounding down upon their measly little homes. We control each of these things, don't we? So why not use them? We don't need to give up our resources to get what we need. We merely need to barter with the sky itself. We need some food to shore up the emergency rations. Let's offer a settlement three months of sunlight in exchange for that. What about replacement parts for the Raptor? That'll be a season of rain just for you. Some more medical supplies? The next group of raiders that come for your little settlements surely won't be... Shouldn't won't enjoy being struck by lightning, no? He chuckles, bringing a hoof down on the cloud. We live upon the greatest economic potential in the wasteland. Let's use it. We can maintain our economic potential. Oh, we can maintain our dignity, maintain our way of life, all while enhancing it with the goods from the surface. Even better, we can do it with a clean conscience, all while staying true to our valued principles. Tornado means well, but his methods is crude and unnecessarily violent. By simply making use of a monopoly over weather, we can achieve so much more at a nearly negligible cost. Who wouldn't want that? He gives the crowd his best smile, holding it awkwardly as the seconds tick on. Finally, some point begin stopping their hooves, starting an avalanche of applause equal that of Tornado, with a cheery nod to his dour opponent. Seafire returned to his seat as the Senate began to cast their votes. Tornado is the only one making sense. Maybe Seafire is right after all. Continuation goes down. No, I do not want to increase in continuation, because that would actually lower destruction, so maybe Seafire is right after all. Which goes from 8 to 11%. See how it works? Love it. And we're already over half an hour into this video, and we've gone through, what, 7? 1, 2, 3, 4, well, Five, eight. Eight focuses. Cumulus Federative Request A. My apologies about that, everyone, but I had to take a small little break just so that we can continue on. The Cumulus Federatia Request A. Uh, the Cumulus Federatia and herself have not always been on the best of terms, with a rivalry that dates back to the earliest days of the Enclave a few decades ago. Skirmishes were even breaking out between our two militaries, leading many to theorize that an outright war could erupt. However, much has changed since then. In a bizarre twist of fate, a representative from the Cumulus Federatia, uh, Federatia yeah, has now come before the Senate to plead for our aid. Hello, Senators of New Cloudsdale. My name is Fairwing, and I've come to co here before you on behalf of all cities within the Cumulus Federatia. To request your aid. Our cities are currently going through the worst famine we've seen in centuries, with Pegasi being lucky to get a meager meal once every other day. Our resources are scarce even more so than in the rest of the Enclave, and many of our cities still lay in partial ruin, being unable to repair that which was damaged during the Griffin War. I know you don't have an abundance yourself, and I fully recognize that you must look after yourself first and foremost, but I plead of you to consider giving what you can to help us in our own plight, if not for our cities and for our Pegasi. Thank you. They are on their own. In times like these, we must fly together. And we want destruction. They're on their own. <laughs> cool. The problems at Attic City. Sky freezes have been a has been a matter of great concern for the Senate and the Council alike due to the rather unique surface policy and rapid expansion. Oh boy. So we are surrounded by the Hayseed Walkers as well as the Hayseed Cult. A lot of Hayseed. Sky freezes is the newest power within the Enclave, rising to much to such a status due in large part to the rather controversial policies regarding those on the surface rather than ignore the surface they've instead act out on their own to or act out or instead set out to 
utilize it to solve their needs. Food, response, resources, and the ponies needed to produce them. So of the older senators despise them going to the surface at all, while many of the younger ones objected to them treating those below us as nothing more than slaves. Until recently, this matter was kept solely to the Senate. The recent industrial boom Skyfreeze has experienced put an end to that. Our projections show that they may very well surpass us within a generation, if not sooner. This has led to the Council also getting involved, joining the Senate for several sessions to discuss the best approach to take towards the troublesome city. One such session has been planned to occur today with a representative from Skyfreeze come itself coming to speak on their behalf. To one side of the Senate Hall sat the council, quietly talking among themselves. Autumn's clique and the Feather Falls crowd were notably grouped as far as one another as they could be, while still laying, staying to the side of the room. On the other side sat the Senate. The sea fire positioned at the Senate and Tornado sat as close to the council as he could be. Various political observations and judgments could be made about their seating arrangements, but that wouldn't be what would capture the headlines today. The chatter and the conversations were brought to an abrupt halt as the great doors to the Senate Hall were opened. A military escort rolled trotted in, with an officer dressed in the colors of Skyfree stepping forward. All eyes were on the officers, with many in the room growing nervous that they had sent a military representative. They began to speak now, announcing that the representative of Skyfree's, the first citizen, Brightwing. The cell himself enters the room. Reactions varied from baff bafflement to outcry, with the council and Senate alike descending into trying to shout over one another. Stepping into the room first was first citizen Brightwing, the leader of Skyfree himself. The last two beacons of order within the room were, surprisingly enough, Autumn Leaf and Seafire, both set about calming down their sides, bringing enough quiet for Bright's wing to speak. The stallion himself wasted no time re representing his city. Hello, mares and uh, gentle, sta gentle stallions of New Cloudsdale. You already know that I am the first citizen Bright Wing, humble servant to the finest ponies, or the fine ponies of Skyfreeze. I've come here today to represent their interests, for that is my very job as a first citizen. I know many of you have expressed very vocal concerns regarding the state of our lovely city. Rest assured, I have in fact read all the public statements and interviews to be published in your papers. I've also listened to the diplomats that have been sent to us, both from you and just about every other city within the Enclave. I have listened, and now I'm here to respond. First, I'd like to address a simpler matter at hoof. Morality. Some have had rather sharp words to share regarding your treatment of the surface dwellers. I see that Senator Seafire among you, who has published a scathing, rather scathing criticism about it himself. To these concerns, I simply say that we are helping those under our rule just as much as they help us. We provide them with food, shelter, and most importantly, a purpose. Without us, they wouldn't have be living in radioactive squalor. Would you see them stripped of that? Stripped of these luxuries and thrown back into the full harshness of surface life? Now to address your real concern, our prosperity. Yes, I know very full well that you see us as a rival, a potential enemy even. But I give you not just my word, but my, the word of every pony in Skyfreeze, that we have no ill intent towards our fellow cities. We are largely disinterested in the affairs of the Greater Enclave, and we will leave you and every other city be. With that, I will take any questions you may have. The room once again erupted into shouting. Helping by enslaving them? They might be on to something, but this goes, this goes against everything the Enclave stands for. Well, we like destruction, so... And now we are at a nice 21%. With Election Day, the stage is set and candidates have all said their piece. As Election Day fast approaches, the Pegasus of the Enclave are increasingly growing more zealous in their favor of democracy. This has presented an opportunity for the Senate to remind them of how valuable it is to maintain our way of life. Now we get a functional Senate, we lose some political power. Actually, which one is it? Senate? Ah, we might actually get some more stuff. Let's see. You get more political power, less worth support, political advisor costs. Not bad. Industry planning? Cool. Military matters. A number of issues regarding military policy have recently been brought to the Council's attention. In which we shall choose one at a time. Work is needed because we can do it with some other stuff and we get 0.87 political power every single day. Reference manuals. Well, let's swap it over. Now maybe we'll do one, maybe two a day. Land option. Let's go down with concentration of force. There we go. Very good. And the volunteer problem. The Enclave has more than enough volunteers ready to fight for it. As someone pointed out, there might actually be too many volunteers. Oh boy. And after that, the Navarro Outpost. The Navarro Outpost has been around for a long time and is currently our only service outpost. Recently, some have been calling for it to be reinforced with more soldiers to reflect this importance. And now the volunteer issue. One of the primary factories or factors leading to the formation of the Enclave was the conscription policies of Equestria. Many young Pegasi were forced to fight and die for a cause that wasn't their own. This rapidly led to anti-Equestrian sentiments and that would eventually result in the skies being sealed off. Due to such, it has always been a firm policy of the Enclave to not engage in any sort of conscription. Only those who were fully willing would serve the country. At one time, this led to a very loyal and ideologically fanatic military. However, the various benefits and moderate pay offered to soldiers and veterans alike has led to a massive influx of recruits over the recent years. While some may consider a large army to be desirable, others have begun to voice their concerns regarding the situation. Many of those within the political sphere are worried about the drain of, on resources a larger military would present, as well as taking potential workers away from the various civilian industries. Meanwhile, some within the military itself are concerned about this affecting the quality of the military as a whole. After all, a larger military is not necessarily a better one. The issue has become such a matter of debate that the Council has been forced to make 
make a decision regarding it. They could carry on as is, allowing recruits to flood in. Alternatively, they could set a limit on yearly recruitment. This would solve the situation, but it would also result in a lower pool of pony power to draw from in the event of any conflict breaking out. Embracing new recruits, set limits on recruitment. I like this one a little bit more, because this hurts our construction speed by quite a bit, but we do get more weekly pony power, so. And that's okay. Now we are 26%. Not bad. We're more than an Enclave Senate. Very, very good. We have some secret language next. Very, very nice. Now, I'm feeling like we're pretty good on planes already. We already have monoplane fighters. That's pretty good. Can we get jet fighters? We cannot, just because we don't have jet engines. But we can get them. Nice. Uh, if that's the case, let's go ahead and do some construction basics. It's going to take some time, but that's alright. It's not that much time, though. Neighbor outposts and do internal conflict. Autumn Leaf and Featherfall disagree on just about everything, and these disagreements often erupt into arguments. Yet another one of these arguments has occurred this time over a proposal made by Autumn. The Oasis in a Hostile Land. <coughs> Preposterous! The outpost is as fine as it is and has been for 200 years, Featherfall shouts, fixing a suit. But you don't realize that the outpost is too weak there, as we might as well just evacuate and place our soldiers in a more important location. Autumn Leaf says, as the boardroom goes quiet, except for the slight murmurs of the other generals, the outpost is crucial for the further development of our influence over the area. If we just leave it as it is, where the heck would our other soldiers go? We just can't station those thousands of soldiers elsewhere. In the current situation, they can very much defend themselves. Featherfall says to the board, rupturing the silence, that is the reason we must reinforce it. It is the only one there. It is entirely vulnerable to attack from all around, and any minute, the outpost supply lines could be disrupted, and we could lose, as you said, a few thousand well-armed and well-trained soldiers. Autumn Leaf refutes, stirring more murmurs into the boardroom. A third counselor enters the argument with his own take. What about the energy shield we have there? There's, that's got no way of breaking anytime soon. With the shield up, no bandit, fawn, or enemy could think of puncturing our defenses there. Featherfall is quick to latch under this point and adds, precisely, with the energy shield, nobody could possibly think they could actually take the outpost or even dispose of the soldiers there. It's defended and it's important from keeping us or keeping our influence over that region. He finished chuckling to himself in his side of the room. It seems that the issues were cleared, as Autumn Leaf seemed to have backed down from the dispute, lightly talking with his peers until another officer from Autumn's side st stood. The energy shield could aid in the defense, but it won't entirely re instantly repel any attack on it, so we had need extra soldiers for protection. Autumn himself takes this opportunity to, to chime up. Yes, what if we lose the energy shield? After all, we have no idea what's powering it and no way to restore it should it fail. We must have Pekasai ready to guard the outpost, he says, and the boardroom was once again thrown into a stir of officers voicing their opinions and both sides trying to talk over each other. Autumn Leaf is right. We'll get a workshop and pony power. Featherfall is right. A civilian workshop. Well, we like destruction, so there you go. Now we're 31%. And the Dashites, well, they're just kind of over there. Thunderhead Retirement. One of our Thunderhead class cloud ships has gotten to the point where it no longer is feasible to keep it in the air. Though no one can deny that it needs to be retired, the council remains divided on what to actually do with it beyond that. For every year for the past 143 years, New Cloudsdale has had an annual military parade of bolster support for, over, for our armed forces. Over all that time, the parade has changed very little. The lineup, the amount of soldiers marching, the uniforms they wear, and the weapons they wield all have remained the same since the very first parade. This year, however, Autumn Leaf has called for an addition to the parade, a wing of raptors flying overhead, dragging a massive flag behind them. Featherfall, being the ever-practicalist, practicalist, has uh, voiced a strong opposition to this idea, a strong opposition that rapidly devolved into a shouting match between the two. As Featherfall slammed his hoof down, he let his words fly out with a reckless abandon that threw many of his older council members aback. And where the buck do you intend on getting enough fabric to make such a flag? We can hardly afford to give uniforms to all of our soldiers and officers, let alone supply this vanity project of yours. Autumn Leaf was quick to respond with a matching anger. Our officers can go without then. This is much more than a vanity project. It's a way to remind all Pegasi of her might. Their heated debate raging on for hours, evolving at one point into Feather fall flipping a table and autumn leaf throwing a chair across the room the rest of the council stood on the sidelines spectating the two and whispering among themselves eventually they all came to one conclusion we should back autumn's proposal i like that featherfall raises some good points which is good let's just stay out of this we should back autumn leaf's proposal honestly with all these people killing and uh, not killing each other they're not, they're not killing each other they're just yelling and screaming and at each other like normal politicians and generals but uh, this reminds me so much of TNO Iberian Union between Calduyo, Salazar, and Franco. It, it, this is just basically it, again. People just yelling at each other all the time. The EPA Thunder itself. The largest of the Enclave's cloud ships are the Thunderheads, each of one of which is capable of acting as a mobile fortress in the sky. One of the largest of these is the EPA Thunderous, a truly immense construct intended to serve as a mobile command center during the war. It was planned to serve as a capital ship for the Equestrian Air Fleet, and Princess Luna herself was expected to take up command within it once the war was all but won. Unfortunately, the war wasn't won, and the Princess Luna only witnessed the ship once it's during its constru construction. It never got to see battle with it being completed only a week after the bail fire consumed the world. Our city was quick to claim it upon the formation of the Enclave and it proved a valuable tool early in our history for deterring more desperate cities from trying to attack or anything against us. 
It also proved itself during several conflicts with Griffins, most recently being deployed to defend the lands of the Comolus Federatia during the war. While it's had delighted becoming an icon of our military might, it has also left the military cloudship in a less than ideal condition. Our best engineers are barely holding it together with a healthy amount of jury rigging and duct tape, and we fear it may just fall out of the sky soon. As a result, the Council has decided to retire the beast of a ship. All that must now be decided is to what actually to do with it. The two most popular proposals come from Autumn Leaf and Featherfall, of course. Featherfall has called for the whole thing to simply be scrapped, with all of its components being melted down and turned into raw material to fuel our industry. However, Featherfall argues that it continues to serve our military as a training facility. The rest of the Council must decide which proposal to go for. Scrap it for parts. During the training ground? I actually like that a lot more, actually. You get more daily army XP gain, and starting logistics go of new army leaders is actually very smart. But destruction is the name of the game. How to deal with Red Eye. Our slaver warlord by the name of Red Eye has consolidated a concerning amount of land and resources. We fear that it is only a matter of time before he becomes a threat to us, and discussions have already started regarding what approach to take when the time does come around. We better be ready for him. And then, interference with the Senate? The same, some within the Council have grown concerned about the power that the Senate wields, and are now calling for a preemptive action to be taken to prevent them from threatening us. The strategy to deal with Red Eye, though. Today, the Council has convened to discuss the matter most serious, the first true military challenge of the Enclave. While they have faced and defeated countless foes in the past, they have never ha had before been confronted with a faction capable of leveraging an equal level of industrial might. While many within the Council are dismissive of the actual danger presented by the warlord known as Red Eye, Colonel Autumn and General Tornado have come together in a rare show of agreement, both arguing that Red Eye is an existential threat to the Enclave's way of life. Today the two stand together on the council floor in a rare breaking tradition, specifically with the intent of showing the severity of the situation. Tornado's mouth remained in its usual jagged frown, a sharp contrast to Autumn's iconic smile. The two locked eyes, Autumn's light brown eyes meeting Tornado's yellow ones. The two hold the position for a moment in a silent battle of wills before Autumn finally looks down and allowing Tornado to finally look to the waiting council to his, his face still stoic. Without pause, he begins to speak his voice a low grumble as he orates to the assembled officers. Good morning, honored colleagues. Today, Colonel Autumn and I have come before you to discuss a master of utmost importance, or a matter of utmost importance, that of the Wasteland Warlord known as Red Eye. I understand that many of you don't consider this individual or her supporters to be a threat. I also understand that you would have the would have to be incredibly short-sighted in order to fail to perceive the threat he poses to our way of life as it stands. This individual is simultaneously in possession of the largest military force, industrial center, and population in the Wasteland. As it stands, he is second only to us in total strength, even though we equally easily clip him on every other front. It's important to understand the significance of this for the first time in 200 years. There is a power capable of challenging us, one capable of marshalling the power, manpower and industry of a developed nation to wage war against their enemies, one that has shown itself to be intent on expansion and continued reclamation, one that has actively declared its intent to re forcibly reunite the former equestrian nation. As it stands, there is absolutely no way that Red Eye can attack us at home, but I have no doubt that this fact will change within the next decades or so. Given its current rate of expansion, it is of extreme importance that we ensure our security, and now forever, I'd like to ask you to turn your attention to Colonel Autumn. Tornado offers the council a, do or, a dour nod, stepping away from the platform to allow Autumn a chance to speak. Autumn offers him a polite nod, his face locked in a neutral expression as he steps forward. In less than a second, his expression is transformed from an emotionless line, emotionless line to a glimmering grin as he meets the eyes of the council. Thank you for that speech, General Tornado. I think we can, can all agree that he laid out some of our key arguments here. Now, I feel the need to reinforce the words of General Tornado here. Red Eye poses an, poses an existential threat to our way of life going forward. While it seems absurd, I know he has managed to rally together enough wasteland mongrels to actually pose a threat to our city. There's a long pause as he stops to think for a moment. A few among the audience prepare for us to respond before continuing to speak. And with that in mind, it is important that we act. Now I understand that Tornado intends to put forward a plan of action that would see us striking high-ranking officials and key strategic structures within the Warlord's territory. This will not be sufficient. As much as I would like to end this quickly and quietly, their forces are much too potent for us to cripple with simple assassinations. They make use of artificially created alicorns. Hellishly mutated diamond dogs and thorough, incredibly brutal mercenaries. Even without their leadership, these threats will continue to exist. No, what we need to do is to put a stop to this once and for all. I propose that we begin drafting plans for a surface intervention, effectively immediately. The deployment of raptors and enclave boots on the ground will be necessary to win this war, I guarantee it. I'll see the floor to the tornado, but I ask you to keep the short sightedness of this plan in mind as he speaks. Autumn saunters down from his podium, smirking at Tornado as he does, ignoring the shining cybernetic eye staring back at him. With the Tornado fuming, Autumn takes up position at the side of the podium, allowing the older general to speak. As my <clears throat> colleague said before me, action will be required to face this new threat. That action must be decisive and swift, for our enemy grows ever stronger on a daily basis. What Adam proposes, however, is not the solution. If he had his way, he would be mired in a ma series of never-ending wars, saying our youth to go fight and die in a worthless pit that is a wasteland. Yes, I say war, for that is what it will be. He wants us to sally out and fight, rather than playing to our strength. He wants to stand us in a conflict that will kill thousands of our citizens on one of the most brutal uh, battlefields imaginable. Tornado stares out of the cloud, his wasteland wounds supplementing the argument he presents. He wants this so he can benefit politically. He desires glory and strength and is willing to sacrifice our valiant soldiers to achieve it. I propose a series of lightning strikes to cripple Red, Eye, Red Eye's Raider army before it can grow further in its strength. 
What we need to do is eliminate the threat, not draw it out and create a protracted campaign. If you approve of my plan, my honored colleagues, I will begin preparing the necessary shock troops for the descent. That is all. As he steps down, the assembled members of the council began a fierce debate over the merits of both proposals. Adam is right, we must deal with the red eye once for all. Or we can't override. We can't get overconfident. Let's listen to, to, to Tornado. Uh, Autumn is right. Special war plan has been unlocked. Very cool. After this, a secure system. The military council is here to protect the enclave and is for it to protect as many pe as many Pegasi as possible. It needs to know everything that has has that is happening anywhere, anytime. So smile for the cameras. Strong council, the dominant council. Cool. Autumn Leaf accuses of sin. The council has been called into a special session today at the behest of Autumn Leaf. He seems to be the only one to know what this is about, refusing to tell anyone else about the council at officially ended the session. I know many of you are confused as to why I called you here. This is a matter of utmost importance, one that may directly affect the continued survival of not just the council, but the enclave as a whole. At this, the entire council is brought to attention. Looks varied from eyes of from ones of concern, from ones of open alarm, as such a matter was never to be taken lightly. Even Featherfall, usually quick to dismiss anything Autumn claimed, was now intently listening to every word. Yes. It has come to my attention that there is a grave threat to both us and our city as a whole. A threat so cunning and insidious, it can convince our ponies that it is saving them, even as it darns all of them. A threat so powerful it stands capable of destroying our very way of life. I'm referring to none other than the sin itself. This left nothing but stunned silence as every member of the council struggled to process what he had just said. Before they could recover, he continued. Time and time again, they have sought to strip away our power. Time and time again, they have called to cut our budget or do away with military assets. They will see us fully disarmed, our city left unguarded, and our opponents powerless. If we wish to ensure the continent or the continued survival of not just ourselves, but also our city as a whole, we must take action against this threat. He's right, we need to take them down a peg. Functional center with a weak senate. We lose more political power. As he finally got off the deep end, probably, but we gotta get more destruction in here. 51%. 50, oh, more precisely, 51.2%. We have a secure system going on next, and then we'll do a Featherfall affair. General Featherfall has recently become one of the center of the controversy, after multiple accusations of him abusing his power to his own ends have gone public. This has led to faith in the council wavering, and has caused more reactionary elements within the council to demand Featherfall's immediate resignation. Oof. Now we gotta choose Seafire's accusations, or Tornado's deal. Popular continu continuation, amnesty for loyalty, which I kind of like, for the Featherfall Fair. General Featherfall has never been the most popular of Pegasi. Despite this, he has, had been at least commonly regarded with the respect that is due of his position. His reputation as a rather stagnant leader has only helped to aid in painting him as a stallion of moral character who is not prone to failing to temptation pursuits uh, of self-interest or momentary passion. That is, until recently. General Featherfall's less upstanding activities have also become a matter of common speculation rapidly growing into a dinner table topic for civilians and soldiers alike. Accusations of him selling an officer appointments to the highest bidder paint him in the front of various popular newspapers and many within the military itself are beginning to come forward to give accounts of his corruption. These accounts are buried from claims of him pocketing military funds to him trading sexual favors for promotions. Holy cow. Needless to say, this controversy has rocked the enclave to its very core and has led to the public's faith in the, in the council being shaken. In response to this ongoing situation, a number of senators have begun to recall for an invest official investigation of Featherfall and his dealings. At the head of these sen is Senator Seafires, who raised Tartarus from the start regarding this affair. On the other side of things, the respected war hero General Tornado has called for this entire situation nothing but a hoax, being pushed by Featherfall's rivals as a part of a political power grab. He now leads a minority within the Senate who are defending Featherfall's innocence. Ooh, we lose continuation support. Strong council, huh? So I don't like this one. As much as I love stability and political power, we don't want any more continuation. So really, we got to lower it. So we have to go with Seafire's accusations. See, Senator Seafire's managed to gather enough support among the rest of the Senate to begin an official investigation at General Featherfall. Because we're at uh, 56%. That's not bad. After that, investigate the military council. Seafire suspects that the council as a whole may be more involved with Featherfall's corruption before they're letting on. Uh, as a result, they have become the target of his investigations. So be it. Now we can't do amnesty for loyalty because we need calmer than hotter minds. Calm, hotter minds, but we'll go do the case against Featherfall. A meeting with Autumn Leaf. We'll do this one. Seafire has managed to compile a sizable amount of evidence against Featherfall, leading to the approval of a formal trial against him. Seafire's investigation is no secret. Indeed, he has gone out of his way to ensure that it was publicized as possible as to drum up public support for it. It has led to a number of military officers coming forward with us to, with allegations, which has gone a long way towards cementing our case. Unfortunately, there has been little undeniable physical evidence of wrongdoing last night. An officer came to us with the claim that they were in possession of a great deal of hard evidence against not just Featherfall, but also the council as a whole. They claimed to have stashed a number of incriminating financial documents, internal memos, and even just personal writings within an old military warehouse that stopped being used years ago. If this officer is speaking the truth, then this amount of evidence would be more than enough to ensure that the Featherfall is sent away for a long time. Furthermore, it will also incriminate several other high-ranking military officials. Tonight, Seafire himself will be taking up a team of trusted officers and investigating the warehouse. Upon getting there, they will find files full of evidence. Oh, weak Senate with a functional Senate. Or, an empty warehouse. Visionary support goes down. Hmm. Strong council with a functional council. 
Weak council. There's a weak senate. We do get more political power that way. Strong council will becomes a functional council. So we get more political power too, which I kind of like. An empty warehouse. I want less visionary support. Ah oh, man, screw it. I'm just gonna go to empty warehouse. Why? Because that that continues to strengthen Autumn Leaf's position. And then a meeting with Autumn Leaf. Colonel Autumn Leaf comes to us with an offer. Look at all the smiles. A case against Featherfall. More than enough evidence has been presented to the Senate for them to approve a formal trial. Several lawyers have already been invited to join the investigation and are now hard at work trying to build as, uh, as solid of a legal case as possible against Featherfall. We expect to face considerable resistance in trying to convince the Senate of his wrongdoing due to a number of older senators being longtime supporters of his. While this process is ongoing, Senator Seafire has decided to take full advantage of the situation for his political efforts. All he must do now is decide whether he wants to focus on reminding the public that the Senate is here to deal with problems like this, or push for the public to lose even more faith in this council. Either choice would benefit his own political career, so it matters very little what he goes for. We think the Senate for ensuring our military's integrity. Never never let us forget the council's betrayal of our trust. Well, it's either one. I like the political power cost, because that's we should thank, thank the Senate, I guess, for now. After this, fate of the general. Either falls fate must be decided. There's a knock on the door behind it, lies no other than Colonel Autumn Leaf with here with an offer. His support for our, in our endeavors in exchange for a simple demand being met. His demand is for a sizable number of supporters to be appointed to various ranking positions within the military. While his demand may be simple and well within our power, it would also be a blatant act of corruption. The Colonel's views are also a matter of great concern as it can hardly be considered a political ally on the other hoof. The Colonel's support could be invaluable. He would grant us a voice on the council itself and not as inconsiderate or inconsiderable amount of supporters would likely fall in line with whatever stance he takes. You've got a deal? Get the buck out of my office. Well, we want more destruction, don't we? So you you got a deal. And then new government. The votes are counted and the results are in. Soon. To a procurement, don't mind if we do. Results are in. Trial. Feather Falls trials attract as much attention and commentary as the election itself. With every newspaper and tabloid from here to the Las Pegasus taking, talking about the event. It's become the topic of many heated debates between those who defend his innocence and those who call for his resignation and arrest. He has been brought forth before the Senate to be tried for his alleged crimes of bribery, embezzlement, and favor trading. To these charges, he pleads not guilty. As the day progresses, a number of witnesses are called forward to testify for or against the general. Evidence is presented and refuted, heated arguments are had back and forth, and the room must be calmed on several occasions. After nine hours straight of back and forth presenting, debating, and arguing, the Senate finally reaches a conclusion. Featherfall has been declared guilty. Oh boy. Oh, look who it is. Autumn Leaf. Hello there. And we have absolute control. Autumn Leaf rises to power. In an unexpected turn of events, Colonel Autumn Leaf and a slew of his followers have stormed into the Senate Hall, declaring that the elections for the Senate is a sham to harm the ponies of the Enclave and that Autumn would be installing himself as our temporary leader until true democracy could be restored. Most senators have been placed under house arrest, and military officials are being appointed to various positions within the civilian government. Today, excitements ended with a public speech by Autumn during which he assured the public that he will take swift action for the sake of the Enclave and that the suspension of the Senate was fully justified because it because it was a corrupt governmental body that, after the elections, would only do to harm our ponies. When asked if he had any other plans to reinstate the Senate, he had this only to say, I am the Senate. To accompany his speech, a massive military parade filled with the, with the mightiest of the enclaves of military was paraded on New Cloudsdale, emphasizing and cementing Autumn's authority over the city. Only time will tell what Autumn will do for the enclave and what unintended consequences might come from the suspension of one of the enclave's most important governmental or government structures. That is an amazing picture. Wow. The enclave shall prosper? Enclave military junta, huh? Oh, it's kind of hard to see because it's so small. But let's finish our episode with a focus. So, we finally unlocked other parts of the tree. Some other parts. So, we could do this at the Great City of New Clouds. Got two months for a few more workshops. Or we'll just go with Institute Emergency Powers. Aw, oh, yeah, democracy has failed us. Our people are starving and weak, and we are shadow of our once proud and prosperous nation. These last 200 years have been nothing but stagnancy, devoid of expansion and change. No longer starting today, the military shall be taking full control of the civilian government for the good of all Pegasi. And that's going to conclude today's episode, my friends. If you enjoyed it, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you all tomorrow when we shall use or lead with Autumn Leaf into making... Equestria, a great place again. Thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day.